Welcome to the Inspire Advantage webinar on dealing with rejection from medical school. Um, I'm glad you all could be here this evening. My name is Hallie Caldwell, and I'm a part of the Inspira Advantage team. And I have two of our great consultants here with us today who are going to walk us through this topic. That's clear. It's obviously a pretty rough topic, but something to be prepared for. Um, Inspire Advantage, if you don't already know, is a, an admissions consulting company that helps students applying to med school and other medicine-related um, fields, schools and other medicine-related fields. Um, we help with everything from beginning to think about applying to med school, building your candidacy, to helping students through every part of the admissions process from getting letters of recommendation, taking the MCAT, filling out primaries, secondaries, interview prep, etc. Um, and we're glad you could all be here today. So see, so yeah, we'll dive in and have our consultants introduce our, themselves. Um, we have Adita here with us today. Hey guys, my name is Aditya. Um, I recently graduated from Mayo Clinic um, Alex School of Medicine, Arizona. I'm currently a first year radiology resident up in Mayo Clinic, Rochester. Great. Thanks so much for being here. Um, and we have Jennifer here with us as well. Um, can you hi. give a introduction? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I also went to medical school at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona with Aditya, which is very funny that we're both on this webinar. Um, I just started residency in OBGYN at Duke University. Awesome. Thank you both so much for being here. It's always a pleasure to have you both. Um, so today we're, we just did some introductions, but we're going to talk about the different med school outcomes um, with a focus on rejections here, what it means to get rejected from med school, some tests, like steps that you can take as soon as you get that letter, and then the things to think about. Um, after that, what to do next, what steps should you be taking, different paths that you can take. Um, talk about some tips mainly for self-care and make sure you're taking care of yourself through this process. It's a long, rough one, um, but doesn't need to be at the end of the road. And then we'll open things up for a Q&A. So if you have any questions as we go through this, feel free to pop them in the Q&A chat and we'll get to them at the end. Thanks so much, Hallie. Um, so there are three decision outcomes that can happen from the medical school process. Ideally, everyone wants to be accepted into medical school. And if that happens, great. You know, you have that um, letter. They'll probably give you a um, deadline. I think maybe it's around like May, the end of the application cycle, where you put in your deposit and you decide that's where you want to go. You can have multiple, um, but then you can only choose one at that time. The second one is kind of a gray area, uh, wait list. It's kind of like a semi-rejection, semi-acceptance. It's essentially that you're put on this secondary list where the people that got acceptances, if they decide not to come, they will pull from that list. Um, sometimes these wait lists can be ranked. Uh, you don't necessarily know your place in the rank list, but you can try to interact with the programs to show that you're interested so that they'll be uh, thinking about you if they ever have to pull from this wait list. And uh, for the third one, rejection, um, it, you know, it is a very real possibility to get rejected from schools. Everyone's been rejected, even people who get into medical school. You know, we're not getting into all our choices. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, there are some people that don't get into any the first try. And, and you know, from there, it's just a, a decision of what should we do next. There are certain parts of the application you can work on. Um, there are certain things that you can try to focus on for next year. And so that's kind of the whole basis of this entire uh, webinar is to, to figure out strategies for how to be better next time. And then there's like no way around it. It's gut-wrenching to get rejected from med school, whether it's one school or all of the schools. It is not, not a good feeling. Um, let's dive into this a little bit more. So I think when you start getting rejections, um, I totally agree. I remember getting my, when the rejections kind of start piling in, because you apply to so many schools nowadays and you can't get into all of them. And I think some things to keep in mind, the first is perspective. It's not the end, you know, especially as rejections kind of start coming in by email, you know, remember that for some people it is a longer road than for others. And if this is still your journey and still your plan, there are definitely still options and plenty of people get in their second time around. 
or it might be a time to just reevaluate, you know, what your motivations are and, and what your future plans are. And we'll kind of talk about that later. Yeah. And then also remember as the rejections start coming in that a lot of the time it's it's luck in a numbers game. You apply to so many schools for a reason. If you think of an admissions committee, they're going through thousands and thousands of applications. And a lot of time they're only spending a few minutes for each one. And sometimes you can't really figure out why you get an interview at one place, but not at this other program that you really loved. And just remember that sometimes it is a, a little bit of luck. And I, I think remembering that really helped me, even though sometimes it's frustrating to think of all that hard work you put into it, but sometimes it is a little bit out of your hands. So just keep that in mind too. Yeah, absolutely. And acceptance rates are so low. Schools just can't admit as many people as deserve to go there. Aditya, do you have anything else to add to this? Yeah, I mean, as you were saying, acceptance rates are really low. Um, you know, there there is a growing need for physicians and there are a lot of people that are applying to medical school and the number of applicants is just growing a lot faster than the number of physicians. So hopefully there'll be some catch up, but that's kind of currently the era that we're in right now. Um, so this does make this conversation a little bit more relevant. So next steps, you get that letter, you take a second to feel your feelings, um, which are all valid and should be felt. Um, first, like first thing you should do is rest. Um, and Dita, you can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. So again, I mean, it's just a one word prescription, just, just rest. And, and what we really mean by that is it can be very easy to kind of get into this um one defensive mode or like hypercritical mode where you start thinking okay what did i do wrong i need to figure out um everything i need to do with my application uh you know you can have feelings of just kind of imposter syndrome at some point um thinking that you just are not good enough to to be in medical school to begin with um and while it is important to reflect and kind of start a constructive process of of how to pick a strategy for next year uh, we would advise that at least for right after you receive these rejections and it's completely final that this cycle, you know, it's not going to happen to take some time to just completely step away from the process. Um, even if it's like a week or two, however much you feel comfortable, because, you know, you're going to have that adrenaline rush. You're going to be in the zone. You're going to be thinking very critically about what is it, what it is that I, that I did wrong. Um, and if you take those couple of weeks to, to just kind of not look at the material and, and come back to whatever you have with a fresh eye, you might have a better perspective, a more level-headed perspective. You'll be a little less attached to your application per se, so you can look at it more objectively because that's part of the process that you need to do as well. And Jennifer will talk about that a little bit later. Um, but part of this is being objective and being uh, very like truthful about what it is that you need to work on. And, and it can be very hard to do that right after you receive a rejection. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, I know this is a pretty short slide and self-explanatory, but do you have anything else to add to this? It's short, but it's important. And you know, I think Adidia hit kind of all the main parts, but just being kind to yourself and just taking a step away and, you know, exactly, exactly as, you know, he said, just you'll be able to look at it with a little bit more clarity. And then also you put a lot of hard work into this and it's okay to take a break from it. And, and you should, instead of diving right back into trying to reapply when you're already tired and a little burnt out, you're not going to have as an effect of, of a, a strategy or application. Perfect. So after you rest, um, you can take some time to process everything. Yeah, take this away, Jennifer. Yeah, I think this is um, a really important process. Um, so, you know, we kind of touched on it, feel your feelings, you know, however that is. And there's a lot of different ways that people like to process. Some of it can be, you know, journaling, self-reflection. It can be talking with a loved one, with a friend, with a classmate, with a mentor. And, you know, this can be your time to just kind of go through all of your different emotions. And you're certainly going to feel all of them, you know, anger, frustration, sadness, worry, and all of the things. But you know, I kind of mentioned this before, also be kind to yourself. This is a, a very tough um, application process and it's a really hard journey. And if it were easy, everybody would do it. It's tough for a reason. And, you know, just 
kind of remember that it, it is a process and it should be hard. And how would you, you know, treat somebody else that was going through this and remembering to kind of have that own kindness and compassion towards yourself? I feel like that's when you're going through rejection, it's like the worst thing to hear when someone's like, well, how would you, how do you like deal with it? If I was rejected and like treat yourself like that, it's really hard to be critical of yourself, but um, exactly. Yeah. It's a important step. Adita, anything else to add to this? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the stuff that, we, you know, that we could say re re kind of reflects just like the concept of rejection in general. Um, but I think, again, it's it's very hard to not be emotional about this. And it, it, and it, it's totally valid. Um, it's important to feel those things um, and kind of work through those things. Um, but at some point, it'll be important to kind of have a, a good mindset about this is not the end of the road, right? This is, um, you know, this is not the end of the path. There are many different ways forward. Um, and it's just not that everyone will have the same regular path going forward you know stuff for some people it may take a little bit more time that's okay okay but when you're a physician for 20 plus years no one no one picks the position because this guy got in the first time or this guy went in straight after undergrad you know, you know physician's a physician once you make it that's a good thing to remember definitely all right so then you'll need to make some decisions you have some options yeah here. so yeah, so there are different ways to go about this, um, and your strategy will change depending on what you do because the amount of time that you have to improve your application, if that's what you decide to do, or or try to uh, you know get new mentors or try new activities, your opportunities are going to be very different uh, depending on what you decide to do. So the first one you can do is just try again. So if you decide to try again the next cycle, you even though it is like the next year. Okay, I'll apply next year. You really have at most a couple months, three, four months to put it together another application. Um, because if you get rejected and you decide, okay, this is the end of the road for this year in May, you know, you're going to have to start applying again by the fall. Um, and so you pretty much only have like a summer. It's almost like you have like a summer internship type of um, timeline to kind of get something else on your application and then try again. Um, and so, you know, if you're trying to be a little ambitious and add more stuff to your resume, you know, you're going to have to be mindful of that. You may not be able to add that much and you might have to have other strategies that you do for that. Um, another way that you could do it is take a year off. This way you actually have a full year to do something. Um, and this is a reasonable choice as well. It's not, it's not a bad choice. Um, you know, for example, if you decide that your application needed more research time, right? Like just doing two, three months of research, you're probably, I'm not going to be able to get much out of that. But if you take a full dedicated research year, because that's what your application needed, your application looks a lot stronger. And to programs, it also shows that, okay, you took a year off and you identified what it was that you needed to do and you did it and you did it for a full year and you're back, back to try again. That could actually look very favorable to a lot of these programs. And then the third one, um, you know, for some people, this may be the way that they decide to do it, um, where they decide to go another way. You know, I have friends who just tried to apply to medical school and they did not uh, get in. And ultimately they decided that perhaps medicine is not what they wanted to do. Perhaps they do like healthcare, but you know, perhaps patient care is not exactly the thing that they wanted to do. And they decided to go a different way, their business or tech within healthcare. And that's also a perfectly fine choice as well. This is one that I think is very, a case by case basis. You just have to really sit down with yourself and understand what are your motivations for going into the field? What is it that you truly enjoy? And if you're able to find those things you enjoy in a different profession that is related to healthcare, um, you know, that could be something that you could explore as well. Um, and I think if you ever decide to come back, you can, you know, there are a lot of non-traditional applicants who have had lives before coming to medical school. Uh, it's not that if you step away from this now, it's completely shut. Great. Jennifer, anything else here? You know, I think I would just, yeah, emphasize the last point that I think a lot of times stepping away or deciding to do something else feels like a failure. And, you know, you're at, at the point in your lives and careers where you don't really have any, you shouldn't think that you have anything to prove to anybody else, right? It's about what you want to do with your own life and your own profession. And 
deciding that some other career path is a better fit is ultimately going to be better for you in the end. And, you know, you might look at being rejected in this process as a blessing. And I also had friends who didn't make it the first time around and then kind of realized that there was something else they would rather be doing, whether that's working as um, an advanced practice, uh, advanced APP, I don't know why I'm forgetting the acronym right now, where they could have more of a family life balance, but still a really similar scope of practice or doing a PhD program because they were actually more interested in research and academia or working in public health or working for the government. There's a lot of ways that you can make a similar impact without going down this really long and arduous road. All right, so if you decide you want to either take a year off or immediately move forward, there's definitely some steps that you should take um, at, before you kind of dive back into that application process. Yeah, I think the, the best place to start really is getting feedback. And you know, even after you've taken some space and some rest, uh, a lot of times you're too close to it. You know, this is why you have people proofread your personal statement. And, you know, you have a lot of people lay eyes on your primary and your secondaries. Because sometimes when you've worked with something too much, you're not always the most objective um, and most critical person of it. So, you know, once again, talk to your friends, talk to colleagues, talk to mentors. Try to really understand their point of view and understand and kind of start gathering all of this feedback because the next step is going to be really sitting down and analyzing why didn't why didn't you get in right and we kind of think of applications as having different areas there's different kind of check boxes that admissions committees are looking for so was it that you didn't have a demonstrated leadership and community service or was it you didn't have enough research did you not show enough of a demonstrated interest in medicine or well, your grades just not quite making the cut was your MCAT score bad um, you know these are all different kind of areas that you can really think about and if you're taking time off work on over the next few months or next year because that last step is going to be improved because if you're not making significant or demonstrable improvement in your weak areas then there's really no sense in reapplying um, I think another area that we kind of haven't touched on, maybe maybe we will either, is just your strategy. You know, a lot, I've worked with clients before where they have this great application and then they look at the rejections and can't understand why they didn't get in. And kind of understanding that um, a strategy is a big part of the application process too. You know, what schools did you apply to? What um, kind of program characteristics are going to most resonate with your application. You know, if you're somebody who isn't interested in research and doesn't have a strong research background, did you mainly apply to schools that are known for being re really research heavy? I think those kind of strategies and, and that kind of planning um, is something that we can really help with. And then also any, you know, mentors, other med students, kind of word of mouth, learning about the programs. But that sometimes just changing the programs that you're applying to can be enough to get in somewhere too. Yeah, great points. Thank you. Zita, anything else here? Yeah, I, I agree with all those points. I just wanted to emphasize. Um, so like when, when, when we were talking about these things, I was imagining, okay, if I were in this position, what would I do first? And the first thing I would do is identify like my most trusted professional mentor and then see if they're willing to go through my application with a fine tooth comb. Like we'll meet together. I'll bring my application. I'll bring my CV and just say, okay, well, like, uh, wh what do you, th what else do you think I need to improve on this? And the reason I do this is that mentor in a way, well, has been with you the entire journey, right? They kind of gave you their seal of approval, their blessing. Right. And so they did that hoping that you would get in as well. So they clearly saw some good parts of your application. They can identify what those are. And then maybe they can also say, okay, maybe this is something else that we can work on as well. And, and you just kind of, kind of go from there. And this is kind of where networking is important as well. You know, it can be a little uncomfortable, but if you have people in your institution that you're willing to cold email to just say, Hey, like I'm a reapplicant. I, I, I hear that you've had experience with medical school admissions, not people who are actively on the committee, but just like, see if you can, cold email people and, and if they can just kind of briefly look at your application as a fresh new 
application and see if they can point out some things that you can work on. That could be um, something as well. Thank you. All right, here's a to-do list of things that you want to consider. Um, kind of the steps, yeah, steps you can be taking to improve your application. Yeah. So this is part of kind of the strategizing process, the like post-mortem, what is it that, uh, you know, perhaps could have been improved. Um, some of the ones that can be easy to look at, um, you know, was it your GPA and was it your um, MCAT courses or your, your MCAT score? Um, as Jen was saying, you know, part of the strategy is choosing schools that are within your range. So, you know, if you apply to schools where the, the average MCAT percentile is almost a hundred percentile and, you know, maybe you're not, you're not very close to that. Maybe that's something to reconsider. There's like different, different um, tiers of schools that you can, you can look at. Um, that's like the easiest one to kind of nip in the bud, retake the MCAT again, see if you can get a, a better score uh, and go from there. Uh, the one that's a little bit more nuanced is kind of looking at the work experience, the travel experience, and the volunteering experience. Um, that's the one that would probably take like a full year to 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 get through. If you feel like research is what you need to do, take that research year. If your volunteering wasn't strong enough, do some volunteering, right? But don't don't just join a club and go to the meetings. Like do something extensive, do something that is meaningful and that shows that you're trying to make an impact. Um, because again, they programs can see through that. And especially if you had a year and that's all that you've done, um, you know, they can kind of definitely see through that. If you're reapplying, there's almost kind of this like implication that, okay, like you've identified that this is what you need to work on. And so you need to show that you've given some due diligence and effort to try and, and make that an impactful part of your application. And then also it could have just been logistics, you know, perhaps your personal statement wasn't as strong. That's something that, you know, working with mentors, working with, you know, companies like Inspira, we can help with making that a little bit better. And, you know, perhaps it was a little bit more preparation time. And also something else that I, I've, I've noticed sometimes some, some, some people don't take it seriously is applying early, as, especially for medical school applications. As soon as that application is open, you need to submit that thing within like the first couple of hours, if you want the best shot. But I've, I've had friends who, you know, waited, they're like, okay, let me just like work on it. It opened last week. Let me work on it. Oh, it's not, it's technically not due until December, but it would open in September. I have till December to do it. No, that's not the way you should do it because these interviews are rolling as well. Even though the app, the, the admissions and the offers may all be released at one day, the interviews are rolling, right? So if they fill up their interview spots, you're kind of in trouble there. And if you're one of the first applications that they've seen, they're more hopefully more likely to kind of give you those applications as well. So especially if you're a reapplicant, it's very important to be proactive. It's very important to be aggressive in, in this new application cycle to, to try and get your applications out as early as possible. Great. Um, Jennifer, anything else to add to this? No, I think that covered it. I think we're going to hit on the other stuff in the next few slides. Great. So things to be remembering while you're kind of going through this process. Yeah, this just kind of highlights and summarizes what we've talked to, you know, as we're going through all of these steps and asking for feedback and analyzing and putting together your new strategy. You know, remember to show yourself kindness and compassion, take lots of breaks, because if you just applied, then you probably for the last year have been working on this on and off, and especially the last few months, hours and hours and hours every week. So it's okay to take some time and do things that bring you joy. Um, make sure you're actually taking time to process and not rushing into it. You know, as we kind of discussed, there's likely a reason that you didn't get in the first time around and you need to identify those reasons. And if you're not taking the time to really dig deep and discover those, then you're doing yourself a disservice the next time around and costing yourself a lot of money because we all know this isn't a very cheap process. And, you know, don't dwell, don't overanalyze. You know, as we kind of mentioned, some of it's luck, some of it's numbers, some of it's strategy, some of it's just really hard. You know, it's not because you're not meant to do this or you're a failure. It's a lot of times are identifiable improvements and tweaks that you can make to be successful. 
Great. Do you say anything else to add to this? No, I think um, Jen said it great. You know, you just got to remember it's a tough process. Um, and, you know, don't be too hard on yourself, but also you need to identify what you did um, to do it a little differently. You can't just throw in the same application again and expect different results. Yeah. So I think this brings us to our Q&A. So feel free to pop questions in, but um, I'm going to throw a question at both of you. I don't, we didn't really talk about this much. I think we kind of alluded to it with strategy, but um, you both work with students who are reapplying um, and also students who are applying for the first time. And I know that I hear a lot about how a narrative is incredibly important when applying. Um, like, should A, people be reevaluating the narrative that they're putting together for their application? And then how many people do you see, like, just don't have a narrative and really need one and that can kind of uh, bolster their application. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that narrative is, is very important. It's very difficult. Um, there's like an art to putting this application together and that's why you definitely need a lot of time to do it. You know, sometimes I can have like um, people just say, Oh, I, I'm a hard worker. I like, talking to people I want to be a physician and and like and then then they're like okay but and then I did this I volunteered here I I did this work um and there needs to be a little bit more of a like a story and a, and a threat through that um so for example if that was like someone who was a reapplicant that came to me as a client and that was kind of their their story the way I would handle that was first I wouldn't even look at their application I would just kind of first meeting would just dedicate tell me your story like there's got to be more than you just wanting to be a hard worker and and now you're going to go through years and years of school because of that like why are you actually doing this why are you doing this why are you doing this um like uh five whys into like why are you doing something like uh, and then to try to get to the the real reason why something's happening and then once we've crafted a story then i look at their application and i want them to point out to me where they think their story is actually being shown through and where it isn't being shown through and then that way, hopefully in their mind, they know, okay, like maybe I didn't show what I was actually thinking and and they can kind of fill in the cracks that way. I like that. That's some good tips. Um, Jennifer, Jennifer, do you have anything to add about narratives? Yeah. I mean, narrative is so important and I have worked with so many clients where this is so lacking in their application and you know, going back to the thousands, thousands of applications that people in admissions committees are reading, you know, they're skimming. You know, I hate to say it because you just spent a lot of money and time, but they're skimming the first time around. And so you need to put together a concise story that jumps from the page. They need to look over your stuff and know exactly your one liner, you know, who you are, why are you doing what you're doing? And if it's not cohesive from your personal statement to your activities that you've chosen to your secondaries, if they can't piece together those themes of that story, then you're way more likely to get passed over because they just don't have time to try to figure out the puzzle that is you. And so being really clear and obvious about your central theme or thread and you know the two or three values that you want to express you know, this isn't a time for like a potpourri or a hodgepodge, like you're really going to narrow it down and focus. Um, and a lot of times just even doing that alone really gets people success. Great. Um, and then for people who do or get rejected from all med schools, like what is, I mean, not, I know you can't give a percentage chance, but is it a pretty solid chance that students who are reapplying can actually get in? I think a lot of people are definitely not sure if that's actually possible and want to make sure that the time that they put in is is worth it. Yeah, a, a lot of people get in the second time around and a lot of it is reformatting your application, right? Adding some kind of experience. And at least I found it's adjusting the schools you apply to. Mm -hmm. I think when people are starting out, especially if you're applying from college, people tend to apply to the big name programs that they've heard of, right? So everyone's applying to Harvard and Yale and Brown and Hopkins, these schools are not <laughs> schools most people get into, right? Like the acceptance rates at these schools are like less than a percent. 
because everyone's heard of these schools and they get 10,000 applications a year for a class of 70. You know, normal people are not getting into these schools, no matter how good your application is. So really sitting down and thinking about like, what do you want in a program? Where do you live? Do you want to stay in that area? Are you going to apply to certain geographic regions? Just being a lot more purposeful and strategic in your school selection. Sometimes that alone can be a really a huge game changer and, and add a lot of success to people the second time around. It's a great point. Thank you. Adiza, do you have anything else to add there as well? Um, yeah, I think it it's uh in, instead of asking the question, oh, what's my chance of of getting uh getting in again? I like you just have to understand if there if there are no serious changes made to the application, like it's going to be going to be slim, right? Like my question I ask you is, okay, if you were to throw that same application back in, what realistically, what do you think are your chances of of getting that of getting in again? Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of strategy that needs to be more involved. So obviously reforming the application, and as Jen said, perhaps you have to apply to a different um set of schools involved. it is possible it is a it is a bit more of a painful process being a, a reapplicant and and having that stress that oh you may not get in a second time uh, but if it's truly something that you want to do you know that's it, it it's a risk that you're going to have to take and there's not really a true percentage like i we i've had friends that got in the second time too and they're and they're doing great and um and a lot of these schools, any of these schools can have reapplicants come in as well, right? It's just very hard to tell what exactly it is that they did to, to get into the to these schools the second time around. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So anything else you feel like we should have didn't touch enough on or should mention? Um, any advice that you have? Any other tips, thoughts? You know, I was just thinking when Aditya was talking, you know, especially if you're applying to new programs, um, new program, programs don't always know that you're a reapplicant. If you are not mentioning it in your primary application or your secondaries and you're applying to fresh schools, um, they might look, view your application as a first time applicant. You know, if you're reapplying to a school, then you're usually either flagged or there's a box that you have to check to show that you're a reapplicant. Um, so sometimes that can be kind of nice to feel like you're also giving yourself a fresh start by applying to different schools. That's great. Um, do you think like, is that something that's recommended or do you recommend that students or applicants try to let this, if a new school know that they are a reapplicant? Is there a strategy around that? There's strategies to both ways. I think it depends on what was missing from your first application and what you've changed. You know, if you were just somebody who didn't have a strong narrative, didn't really proofread, didn't have a good personal statement, didn't choose good schools, then maybe that's somebody that I would maybe suggest to apply to different programs and kind of go in as a fresh applicant. Um, but if you have a really compelling story about how you've grown and improved, everybody loves a good growth story and everybody loves an underdog. And if you can really show what you've gained, then I think that can be a really powerful um, story and a strategy too. Fantastic. Adita, anything, anything else there? Um, I mean, something that I was like, I, I actually haven't tested it out, but I wonder like, um, like, you know, how like in, in like a, like a video game, uh, you can like kind of see the stats of a character. And so I'm wondering if that's like a, an exercise someone can do as well. Look at your application, <laughs> volunteering, research, work experience, grades, and then just like kind of see what, what percentage you, you hit. And then if you can kind of see the overall, you see, okay, there's a little bit of a divot in uh, this part of the graph, this is the stuff I don't really have much of. Maybe this is what I need to up a little bit more. Just different ways of reflecting. Um, it's not really necessary, but reflection is is definitely the the key part. So if you do it that way, if you do it with the mentor, you just need to identify what it is that you need to do differently. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and I'll throw in here too that in Spirit Advantage, where um, we help um, folks who were rejected go through their applications like Jennifer and Adita can help you um, or consultants like them can help you go through and kind of identify places where you can grow and strengthen your application um, and help you do that um, definitely not the end of the road and there's a lot of support out there for you and a lot of people 
rooting for you as well. Um, also, I think that's it for questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. We're going to send out an email with a recording of this webinar um, in the coming day or so. So be on the lookout for that. You'll also find this on our website um, along with other webinars as well. We have one more webinar next week on the MCAT. So feel free to tune into that. And then we'll have a whole host of new webinars starting mid-January. Um, Jennifer and Aditya, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you both. And yeah, thank you for your time. And I hope you both have great evenings. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Thanks so much, Bye. everyone. Take care. Bye.